The, um, <coughs> I'm trying to get um, a protean and an elusive thing called Ciceronianism um, into position. As if you've read the if you've read the Quill essay, you realize that, um, as we were saying last week, Quill keeps defining what became the predominant rhetoric of the English Renaissance as Baroque or Senecan in opposition to something Ciceronian. He never produces an example of anything he calls Ciceronian, though. And the harder you look, uh, the more that evaporates. It's as if it were a um, it's as if it were a necessary straw horse used for defining something else. Now, part of the problem is that um, the real Ciceronian um, thing really only works in Latin. So it became a kind of, it became a kind of mental ideal um, to be reacted against. Well, I, found, uh, I found Gabriel Harvey's Ciceronianus, of which you have one page, there's a text and a translation, and that's very handy because Gabriel Harvey gave this lecture 16, 1583, I think. If it's not that, it's within a year of that, 1583. Public lecture in Latin at a university, the way lectures used to be given at universities. Um, well, uh, the, the English is following fairly closely, but time and again, you'll notice that the English translator <coughs> breaks a long sentence up into shorter ones. Uh, English not having the resources to manage sentences of Ciceronian length. And you can see that happen, um, happening or, um, about ten lines down, there's a Latin sentence that begins, Alia est em tali, alia aliorum purpura. Tully's purple is one thing, and other people's purple is something else. Colon, and, which synesist is so, and so on. You notice that on the, on the English page, the English translator has broken off after something else and started a new sentence. Yonder sun on high, which is um, at synesist is so, um, <coughs> and then he breaks again after behold and get in the sentence about homo and things flitting like ghosts is shut off by itself now that is all one huge syntactic structure in the latin it goes all the way from alia down to at et homeros volatile vidianter as homo says they are seen to fly around and that's a, that's a good illustration of the problem of, work, of being truly Ciceronian in English. The resources for managing a sentence of that length with those particular systems of subordination just aren't easily available. <coughs> one, thing, one thing that works, which we're we'll getting at that sentence again, alia est em tuli, alia aliam pupera. The um, alia, alia, purpura, the, um, the case endings are holding together words that um, belong together. But it, it's really an acoustic device, and a very simple acoustic device. It's simply built into the um, grammatical structure of Latin. <coughs> Remember, this was, this was written to be read aloud or to be spoken. People would get it by ear. And people would be guided through these long sentences in part by hearing those uh, by hearing those noun endings and adjective endings. Alia stum tell you alia aliorum prepare. And then there's a play between alia and alia and aliorum, which is a a genitive plural of the same a genitive plural of the same stem. <coughs> um You can see all kinds of little internal patterns. A few lines down, you can see quibrosoanisima, clarissima, equinoctica, leucansoanisima, clarissima. <coughs> um, the pairing of pulchritudina acfogora, which are two, two nouns in the same, in the same case. 
<coughs> uh, English having said the purple of Marcus Tully is one thing that of the others is something else you notice that all those words are unrelated to one another uh, acoustically <laughs> You don't, you don't have the alia, alia, alien pattern, for one thing. You don't have the ah, ah, ah pattern for another thing. You have totally, uh, acoustically, totally unrelated words. And the only thing English can generally do is stop and um, take a breath and begin a new <coughs> sentence, leave that behind and go on. <coughs> People struggled with this because Cicero is a um, Cicero and the Ciceronian kind of thing, which involves a very large symmetrical sentence with a great deal of acoustic ornamentation, meant for the ear. Uh, people struggled with this because that kind of sentence was so much admired as an obvious thing we ought to be able to reproduce if we could only find a way. Um, I'm going to suggest, I, I gave you a piece of a fairy queen to suggest that um, it can be done in verse. And the reason it can be done in verse is that the acoustic patterns are foregrounded. Look at on the right hand page at stanzas 74 and 75. Um, <coughs> I'll read. I read this, the while some one did chant this lovely lay, ah, see who so fair thing dost fame to see, you notice the acoustic patterning starting up, in spring and flower the image of thy day, ah, see, here it is again, ah, see the birds and rose, how sweetly she doth first peep forth with bashful modesty, that fairer seems the less ye see her may. Lo, she soon after how more bold and free her buried bosom she doth broad display. Lo, she soon after how she fades and falls away. So, that's the Ciceronian gesture. When you you build up the image and then you have the then you have the the conjunction that ties the next member to it. So passeth in the passing of a day of mortal... Now, just notice the, rhyme, the same rhymes are continuing. So passeth in the passing of a day of mortal life, the leaf, the bud, the flower. That's almost Latin word order. <laughs> of mortal life, the leaf, the bud, the flower. No more that flourish after first decay, that erst was sought to deck both bed and bower of money a lady and money a paramour. Period. <laughs> Gather therefore, aha, uh -huh, therefore. <coughs> See, so, therefore. Gather therefore the rose while yet is prime, for soon comes age that will her pride deflower. Gather the rose of love whilst yet is time, whilst loving now may loved be with equal crime. <coughs> I, I would say that the inspiration behind that kind of thing is holy Ciceronian. This is as close as you can get to it in English, and you have to do it in verse. <coughs> the reason being that verse allows you to foreground all those, those acoustic links, which are very numerous beginning with the fact that Spencer has broken from his usual stanza here to the extent of running the same set of rhymes, all of, uh, the same um, set of A rhymes all the, way down through, all the way down to the end of the first stanza and into the second one. If you look over on the left hand page to see what usually happens, the, first, the rhyme on the first line appears in the third and then disappears. That's the normal pattern. But there's no law that says he has to obey the normal pattern, especially since he invented the normal pattern. So he he proceeds he proceeds to do it. This this huge um, th this huge two stanza effect is hung together by lay day may display away day decay. Meanwhile, see she modesty free. Then flower, bower, power, mower, prime, the flower, time, crime. There's that, but look what else there is. Look at, 
if you just look at 74, you can see the RR and the low low. And these are working on system. RR, uh, these are the good things. Low low, these are the things to which we part with power. She's ah ah when she's the birds and rose and she has bass for modesty and she's low low when she turns into a hussy and then starts to disintegrate. And so those pointers are um, those pointers are dividing that stanza into two parts at the same time the rams are holding it together and carrying it right into the next. There's no reason on earth why this whole thing couldn't be punctuated as one huge sentence. There's a, there happens to be a period after day, and another after May, and another after Palomar, but those could equally well be semicolons. And quite conceivably, in Spencer's mind, there was no particular sense of where the sentence began and ended. There was a sense of where the, um, where the clauses begin and end, and you can punctuate that almost at random. The real unit is the whole stanza, in this case it's the whole two stanzas. And this, I think, is what is going on in the Fairy Queen. It's the effort to reproduce the Ciceronian period. And um, the fact that Spencer was felt driven to invent a stanza of that length, based on the, um, I've forgotten what it's called, the stanza that Chaucer uses in Metralis, and that's where, which is, much, which is uh, about two-thirds the length. That's right, thank you. Thank you. But this is a, an expansion. He first appears he needs something even longer. He's, he's, going to do, uh, he's going to grow these huge, uh, these huge blossoms. But each one is going to be self-contained. And then we start the next. Then we start the next one with a formal gesture and bring it up and terminate it with that Alexandrine. That is not far from the kind of effect that was admired in Cicero. The, the, relative, the relatively large structure of attention containing a great deal of acoustic patterning and also what he's doing in these two stanzas is something the orator did all the time. He point to an example in the natural world or some in some world other than the one you're talking about and then you say so and then if you're really uh, if you're really into the arts of persuasion you end it with a therefore and the therefore is what the person is supposed to do I mean you always end with an injunction of some kind so it may just be, therefore, believe what I've told you, or it may be go and do something. In this case, it is go and do something, gather the rose. <coughs> the figures need not be of any originality. This figure of the rose, as the, the passage of the rose reproducing the passage of human, of human comeliness, was all over the place. Waller used it, you remember, a hundred years later do exactly the opposite moral. I mean, the opposite moral is, uh, as the rose is fragile and transient, so is human beauty, so don't invest anything in human beauty. This, um, this, subversive, this subversive business is saying invest everything in human beauty while you can get it. And that, of course, is, that of course is Spencer's point. This is, the, this, is, um, this is not a good place to be in. This is where they, um, this is where they go in for this kind of um, subversive persuasion. Look at another one on stanza seventy-one on the left-hand page. Uh, this is interesting just because of this, the pure me mechanism of the linkage, which again is, a, is an orator's device. The joyous birds shrouded in cheerful shade, their notes unto the voice of tempered sweet. The angelical soft trembling voices made to the instruments divine respondents meet. The silver sounding instruments, you see how it's working, this going 
despairing of renown. The silver sounding instruments did meet with the bass no more of the waters fall. The waters fall with difference discreet, now soft, now loud, unto the wind did call. The gentle robbing wind low answered to all. It's an almost naively transparent device once you see it. And he doesn't repeat it, he uses it in one stanza and goes on to find something else the next time. But th these are all, um, <coughs> these are devices out of the author's bag of tricks for keeping you, um, for keeping you oriented through a fairly long unit of attention. One is to just keep working through a list and making the formal transition by repeating the last number. Um, the birds, voice, voice, voices, voices to instruments, instruments to water, waters, waters to, to wind, and wind repeats itself at the end. The basic devices, among others, um, the, the surface devices are assonance, rhyme, which is the complete the extreme case of assonance, alliteration, um, even that trick of using this, what looks like the same word as a rhyme word, you see meet and meet. In one case it's meet meaning fitting, and in the other case it's meet meaning, um, how are you? Uh, they're not really the same word, but they end up looking exactly the same on the page and sounding exactly the same. <coughs> um, What's the French name for that? Wim Reese, is it? Is that right? Hmm. For some reason avoided now in English, but still prized in French. Didn't bother Spencer at all, obviously. I think he felt he'd made a very fine pivot in the middle of that particular stanza, but not one you do, it's not something you do too often. <coughs> um, The best short analysis of the Spencerian stanza, I think, is the one in William Munson's Seven Types of Ambiguity, in which he points to the crucial importance of the fifth line. You see, the fifth line is the first place where you get a couplet rhyme. And everything depends on what the syntax is doing at that moment. You can begin, you can begin a new sentence at that point with the second line As in stanza 72, where, the, um, where it says, and witchcraft she from far did thither bring, and then you have a, a real, you have a colon, it could be a period, a real stop, and then there she had him now laid a slumbering, and we've started, we've really started a new syntactic member. <coughs> or you can spill right over, there are a number of things you can do there. But this, is, this poetry is very close to, it's very close to rhetoric. It's, certain, it's, it's not only meant to be taken in by ear, which is one reason we find it monotonous when we just look at it. It's, to, it's meant to be taken in by ear. Um, it's full of ornamentation for the ear. And it's, uh, the unit of its effects is, can be surprisingly long. I've shown you one that spills over two whole stanzas. I wouldn't be surprised if you could find even longer ones. And the Alexandrian, of course, is an, an, a formal way of telling the ear that a, that a stanza has ended. And what that means is it's a way of telling the ear that a whole unit of concentration has ended. Now we're going to go on to something else. And you'll notice that each stanza is, has, a new, has a new subject. The sense we have that now it's about to keep pushing forward is not working here. <coughs> um, <coughs> I failed to point out how stanza 72, which introduces the whole, the whole business, up soon they heard a most melodious sound of all that might delight a dainty ear. 
such as at once smote not on living ground, save in this paradise be heard elsewhere. Right hard it was for right, right hard it was for right, there's in verse. Tricky and turn of rhymes, which did it here to read what manner of music that might be. For all the pleasing is to living ear was there consorted in one harmony. Now, the final line here sets up all the themes for the next one, you see? Birds, voices, instruments, winds, waters, all agree. And then, now we have the agenda for the next stanza. Birds, voices, instruments, winds, waters. <coughs> and one, one last observation. <coughs> we allow, or at least we allowed in the 16th century, a poet to um, play tricks with word order. The prose writer is not permitted. The constant inversions. For all the pleasing is to living ear. Now, one way of putting that is that the, the verse writer <coughs> has some of the freedoms of someone writing Latin. That is, the verse writer has... The verse writer is able to fool with, to fool with English word order in the way that the prose writer can't. And it somehow uh, it somehow be protected by the conventions of the meter understands and it won't look simply uncouth and that permits that permits certain other effects that are normally confined to a lang an inflected language where you can play with the word order because the word order isn't spelling out the syntax <coughs> You can see the um, you can see limitations, obviously. Um. <coughs> this is not a medium in which to carry on um, any kind of any kind of uh, narrative rapidity. Spencer obviously understood that and never tried. It's a medium that offers you things on which you can linger breaks down into into topics. Each stanza is about a topic. Topic from tapas, the Greek word for place, and we write to the common places. That's what topic means, it's a place. It's a place where a, num a number of things that belong together are somehow together. <coughs> the use for vague, meta vague metaphor, it was never quite clear whether the place was your notebook or your mind or some, some metaphysical place where the, great, uh, where the great themes just assembled themselves platonically. <coughs> Anyway, looking for something like English Ciceronianism, parts of the fairy queen's about as close as I can come. And the fact that it's in verse, not in prose, I think is interesting. A, a sense that English prose won't quite accommodate this. And when you um, attempt a Ciceronian pastiche in English, you're going to find that the sentences can't be as long as you'd like them to be that the devices that you're debarred from, notably devices of road order, that you have to go a little easier on the sound patterning than the, than the poet does. <coughs> now look at, um, look at this thing called the Petty Palace. This was, this was, is part of a long book written, you'll be glad to know, by a man named Petty. And that's why, it's a, that's why it's a petit palace. He's, uh, <coughs> he's, having his, he's having his little game right in the title. Um, let's see if I, where's a good place to break into this. Um, 
Oh, page 29, about ten lines, about line eight. Yes, no doubt of it. For like a stream, the more you stop them, the higher they flow. And trees, the more you lop them, the greater they grow. <laughs> you see, that's, it's, it's almost naive. It, it, you, you keep thinking it's, it's trying to be verse. It's not. It's trying to be Ciceronian and do it in prose. And, <coughs> and these are not felt as rhymes. These are felt as acoustic patternings of the kind that Latin case endings allow you to do with your left hand. Trees, the more you lop them, the greater they grow. Or spices, the more they are beaten, the sweeter they, are, they send forth. Or as the herb chamomile, the more it is trodden down, the more it spreadeth abroad. So virtue and honesty, the more it is spited, the more it sprouteth and springeth. For honor ever is the reward of virtue, and does accompany it as duly as the shadow doth the body. <laughs> that's, all, that's quite a sentence. <laughs> I don't feel you have an appetite for a great deal more in that vein, but uh, if you want it, he's giving, he's got more. And, as the sun, though it be under a cloud, keepeth still his brightness, though we see it not, so virtue, though it be dimmed with devilish devices, be dimmed with devilish devices, yet it keepeth, same verb, keepeth her strength and power still, though to us it seem utterly to be extinguished. So that so long as I remain virtuous and honest, I need not care what man, malice, or the devil can devise against me. That's not quite as much like verse as the first one, but you can see the uh, you can see the heavy alliterative pattern in can't you? The um, syntactic parallelisms are constantly being reinforced by some device of sound or other. Something is telling Mr. Petty that he had better not uh, he had better not go in too much for rhyme or it would get cute. <laughs> but he can uh, he can alliterate pretty heavily. Um, <coughs> no dear no no dear children. You can pick up by the way the rhetorical base of this, can't you? And we've come in, in the middle, but what we've come into the middle of is obviously a speech. And in fact, the whole thing is um, the whole thing is in the mode of speech. It's so just the barest narrative devices, and then we get people talking. And when they talk, they deliver orations at one another. No dialogue, as we understand it. No, no, dear children, you shall not by my means be suspected to be bastards. Neither will I make thee, sweet husband, ashamed to show thy face amongst the best of them. And I will let thee understand the villainy which thou viper, cynorix, endeavoreth to death. That's rather neat. You've got a, a chain of three Vs interlocked with a chain of two Ds. <coughs> the villainy which thou viper, cynorix, endeavoreth to death. And, and then the D's go on, and I said, Dear, so fondly indeed, is not the repulse punishment enough unless I beweigh his doings to my husband, and so procure him for their displeasure. <coughs> uh, one reason I chose this particular page was for the sake of the herb chamomile, the more it is trodden down, the more it spread it abroad. It's a beautiful illustration of a commonplace because um, you may remember that word from somewhere. Anybody heard of the herb chamomile before? Well, one of, somebody who's heard about it is Sir John Falstaff, who uses that exact simile in um, Henry IV, part, part one, I think. If I remember rightly, it's the scene in which he is he is playing Howe's father, so that Howe can uh, so that Howe can uh, can rehearse the prodigal son. And uh, it's wonderful to mis. I know Falstaff is not thought of as an eloquent man. He always talks prose, as you remember, which is a sign of something in Shakespeare. Um, it's wonderful the number of commonplaces he seems to know, and uh, one of them is the one about the herb chamomile, which the more he's trodden on, he says, the faster it grows. <coughs> And these things just floated around in, um, you could get them in printed books. Mm. <coughs> One advantage of printed books is that they could have indexes, you see. It doesn't make much sense to index a manuscript book because you can't be sure that the next copy will keep the pagination. 
The result is they didn't get indexed. As soon as you get printing, you get indexes. Simply because every copy will be alike. And with that, you get one of the things you get indexed is enormous collections of commonplaces, which we still have as books of familiar quotations. It's exactly the same thing, with a theme index at the back. So, what if you um, if you want uh, if you want quotations on the road going to the dogs, you can find fifty of them. <laughs> that's the that's the last remnant of the commonplace book. <clears throat> it's one reason so many ideas turn up so continually all over the place. With the purpose, with the purpose of obtaining copiousness, which by the way is the etymology of copybook. Copy book was the book in which you got, in which you put the materials that enabled you to get achieve copia. Copia meaning abundance, never getting stuck. You can see on these three examples that there is very clearly a premium being placed on being able to prolong a topic, <coughs> to adduce more and more examples, and to do this with a um, a kind of symmetrical gracefulness. As far as what is being said goes, it could be put generally in a sentence, but uh, that wouldn't be copia. <coughs> well, the, Se the Senecan Rebellion, you've, I'm sure you've, I hope you've read the uh, Quill paper by now, the, Senec the, uh, the, the counter Ciceronian move doesn't attack the long sentences. In fact, you get longer sentences often in the Senecan form mainly because you aren't trapped inside symmetry. What it tends to do is play down acoustic figures and play up um, what we call figures of thought. That is, antitheses are there to express real contrasts, not just to get nice pairs of words with which we can now do something symmetrical. And um, acoustic figures, alliteration, assonance, and so on, sometimes these are felt to be unworthy jingling, unworthy jingles. You want more matter and less art, and it's that kind of art. Sometimes they're felt to be real impediments to attention. I think that's what happens to most of us trying to read the fairy queen for any length of time. We get, you get, you get so Empson compares it to staring at a very bright light for a long time, <laughs> and eventually you just get a huge, a huge blur in the center of your field of vision, and you can't see anything else. It's not a bad simile. <coughs> it, it's a kind of. Um, acoustic overload going on. <coughs> well, the Senecan, what the Senecan discards chiefly is balance. It, tries to keep, it, keeps the, uh, it keeps the big sentence unbalanced. It will end it with an epigram that was not foreseen, something of that order. Um, <coughs> well, this this leads to two other examples. I couldn't avoid bringing you theories along because um, if we talked about the 16th century and not about you theories, you'd want your money back. Um, one thing that the editors of the Petty Palace say is that Euphuism was really invented by Mr. Petty. I don't know what the editors of Lily have to say about that, but um, it seems rather plausible. Uh, Mr. Petty has um, <coughs> Mr. Petty has much longer, much longer um, sentences, which, among other things, means that he's, in at least one respect, closer to the Ciceronian. Long, symmetrical things. <coughs> um, Lily 
although he has driven modern readers up the wall with euphuism, actually, actually goes in for rather short sentences much of the time. Or oh, at any rate, rather short clauses. I hope I've conveyed to you that uh, the, the word sentence is extremely fluid around here. It sometimes, uh, it sometimes doesn't matter very much whether you have a period, a colon, or a semicolon. It's almost as if that were done at the whim of the printer. As I said of the Fairy Queen, there's some of that two stanza showpiece could very well have been printed as one sentence. I'm, I have no idea who was responsible for the punctuation. One thing we know about Renaissance printers is that they didn't necessarily follow copy. They punctuated their own way. <coughs> In fact, it, it was possible for an expert to tell which of four typesetters is working on a given page of the first folio Shakespeare just by looking at the mannerisms of spelling and punctuation. And that means that they're not following the manuscript, they're doing it their own way. <coughs> According to God knows what system, if any. <coughs> um, look first of all at the page headed a victim, the victim of fashion, because that has, this is from somebody else's book, but it puts two exhibits side by side. The Victim of Fashion, by the way, is Lily. This is a book about Lily. And he give, he's giving us, I, I find this rather helpful, he's giving us two examples of, euf of more or less euphuism by different people. One of them is, the second one is by Lily, number two, and the first one is by um, Shakespeare's old enemy Green. And um, he points out that Green's natural idiom is the long invertebrate sentence, which means that Green is find, trying to find another way of being Ciceronian. This is what draws people into long sentences. And they look invertebrate. They don't look invertebrate when Spencer does it because there's so many acoustic devices holding them together. When you take those away, then you start looking for syntactic vertebrae and they're hard to find because these things tend not to have syntactic vertebrae. I'm sorry, friend Pharacles, to find you in this dump, <laughs> which is just a, a, uh, a state of depression. That's all a dump is. <coughs> uh, nothing to do with the architectural surroundings. I'm sorry, friend Pharacles, to find you in this dump. So am I the more grieved because I cannot conjecture the cause. You hear the alliteration starting up? And although it be the duty of a friend to be the co-partner of his friend's sorrow, yet I do dare not wish myself a partaker of your sadness, because I suppose you offer an incense at the altar of such a saint, at whose shrine you were not so much as once vouchsafed that I should but sing to a table. Now, if you're, if you're trying, if you're looking for syntax, uh, order, that is invertebrate, but you see what he really thinks is holding it together is alliteration. <coughs> Look at it. It starts off with the word sorry, and that commences a chain of S's that goes right through to the end and gets more and more concentrated. Um, sorry, soul, sorrow, sadness, suppose, incense, saint, shrine, vouchsafe, sing. They're getting more condensed toward the end. Then you have the, the duty of a friend to be co-partner of his friend's sorrow, yet I dare not risk myself a partaker of your sadness. Co-partner and partaker. I, like a, they work there the way a pronoun and a noun would. They, 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 refer to the same, they refer to the same thing. They have the same number of syllables co-partner, partaker, and you have the par in the middle of one and the par at the beginning of the other. This is the sort of thing people were paying attention to. To be the co-partner of his friend, sorrow, yet I dare not wish myself a partaker of your sadness. And sorrow and sadness are synonyms, really. You almost think you've got an antithesis, but you haven't. Yet, uh, because, 
I suppose you are offering incense at the altar of such a saint at whose shrine you were not so much as once vouchsafe, vouchsafe that I should but sing to a table. If this be the care that cumbers your mind, good Pharacles, find some other time for your amorous passions. But if, now we have a parallel if cause, but if it be any sinister mishap which have driven you to, into this dump, then we, we're back at the dump, which, which is, an, among other things, a good acoustic word. You don't, you don't miss it the second time round. I mean, all these circumlocutions <laughs> which have driven you into this dump, either want of wealth or loss of friends or other frown of fortune. That's a syntactic to it, uh, uh, an alliterative to it, of course. <coughs> Only reveal, Pharacles, wherein I may pleasure thee, and I will supply thy want with my will, and cure thy care with such comfortable counsel as my simple wit can afford. Hmm. Uh, he's, he's made some kind of offer. You can be excused if we aren't sure what it is, but... The fairest sands, Pharacles, are oft times most fickle. There you have fair and fickle as the alliteration that sucks off an antithesis. From the leaf of the sea... Ah, here we go with natural comparisons. And the commonplace book is broken open and <coughs> out they come. From the leaf of the sea how they look at most green, then is the root most withered. That's a useful plant to have around for comparisons, isn't it? <coughs> In other words, trust not appearances. That's where it would be listed. When the root of the sea hobo looketh most green, then is the root most withered. Where the sea breaketh with greatest billows, there is the water shallowest. So oft times in the fairest speech lies hid the falsest heart, in flourishing words, dissembling deeds, and the greatest show of goodwill, the smallest effect of friendship. You see how that's just drawing on the commonplace book, don't you? We find the sea hobo, which we would never have learned about any place else, and um, and the bit about and then see how the leader leads us to see break it. Well, if we wanted to know which one to take next, he took one that had the syllable C in it again. No, it is. <coughs> and green. <coughs> now look, see how they look at most green. See break it with greatest. Green and greatest. Then then is the root most withered. There is the water shallowest, withered and water. We managed to keep the um, pairs of letters working in um, comparable parts of this structure. And then the so off times. I don't know what the virtuosos of this kind of thing would have done without the word so. It has the advantage in English of being a monosyllable that is extremely audible. And it, it, it makes a nice um, pivot for a big sentence to turn around because you can hear it. So. <coughs> Oft times in the fairest speech lies hid the farthest, the farthest heart. Fairest speech lies hid the falsest heart, that's almost blank verse. In flourishing words, dissembling deeds, fairest falsest flourishing. Then we get the two D's, dissembling deeds. And in the greatest show of goodwill, the smallest effect of friendship. Greatest good and then greatest smallest are purely, um, <coughs> a purely semantic um, opposition. Greatest, smallest effect of friendship. I cannot, Thalacles, paint out my affection towards thee with colored speeches, nor decipher my amity with the pencil of flattery. Now we're moving vaguely into um, um, old artists' analogies. Colored speeches. A pencil, a pencil until very late was something you drew with. Dr. Johnson uh, wanted Sir Joshua Reynolds to promise never to use his pencil on Sunday. And what that meant was don't make pictures. 
I don't know if I'm not. I don't know if I'm not meaning a pencil right away. We, we started to think of a pencil as a, a humble writing implement. It, it, it could mean anything, including a paintbrush. I cannot paint out my affection towards thee with coloured speeches, nor decipher my amity with the pencil of flattery. Notice the, uh, notice the connection of colour and deceit, and pictures and deceit. That is one of the strangest things about the um, uh, presuppositions of Renaissance rhetoric. Is const the visual is always the world you mistrust. Notice that we have the we still we still say specious, a specious argument, meaning that it looks okay, but there's something badly wrong with it, and that is the same root as a word like spectacle. Specious is something you see. The idea that the eye deceives, the idea that um, what you look at is um, is a paint job, <laughs> as likely as not. It goes with all those invectives against women using makeup. Well, this, this is felt to be in accordance with the. Uh, it's felt to be in accordance with the general deceptiveness of anything visual. Human beings oughtn't to be um, augmenting that bad habit of nature. So here, we, what that means is you trust the ear. You see, you trust the ear. You don't. You never trust the eye. And when you start hearing about colored speeches and the pencil of flattery, when you shift over to the visual metaphor, you're shifting over into the realm of deceit. I dwell on that because in a couple of weeks we're going to encounter the total shift of that to the point where by the, um, by the 18th century, the only sense you trust is vision. And you say it's apparent. <laughs> Any fool can plainly see. And uh, what comes by ear is false flattery. It's a, very, it's a very curious reversal. And it has all kinds of syntactic repercussions. Because you reach the point where the sentence you trust is the sentence of which you can visualize a diagram. And the diagram, uh, the diagram therefore, in, begins to involve connectives like besides, on the other hand in space uh, this and that and in addition <laughs> that's a spatial metaphor in addition and um, alongside that <coughs> it's partly because we miss that kind of connective that we have to find this sort of prose invertebrate I think we, we are so accustomed to having sentences laid out uh, as if in space, well, even to the appeal to um, um, spatial metaphors in the connecting words. <coughs> the chief connectives these people use are and and but. They don't say besides. <laughs> And when you get into anything spatial or visualizable, you're to distrust it, as you see here. But if thou wilt account me for thy friend, and so use me when thou hast occasion, thou shalt to be short find me far more prodigal in performance and prattling in promises, and so I am. <coughs> well, that's a good man, isn't it? <coughs> Well, this is um, this is uh, Farragas greeting Pericles, who is in a who is in a dump, and then, now we have Lily's uh, Philotus greeting Euphues, who is also in a dump. Friend and fellow, <laughs> as I am not ignorant of thy present weakness, so I am not privy of the cause. A much shorter unit of attention right away. And, although I, you see, that's, all, that's really completed. You could, you could have a period there if you wanted. And, although I suspect many things, yet I, can I assure myself of no one thing? 
again, it's, it's, it's pretty short. Therefore, my good Euphues, for these doubts and dumps of mine, either remove the cause or reveal it, period. Thou hast hitherto found me a cheerful companion in thy mirth, and now shalt thou find me as careful with thee in thy moan, period. The acoustic patterning is still going on, that's clear, but the, uh, the members are pretty short. Um, I'm not going to say they're epigrammatic, but they're, <laughs> they're pushing that way. If altogether thou mayst not be cured, yet mayst thou be comforted. You begin to pick up a favorite device, which is to have two parallel clauses, or two antithetical clauses, and end them with a pair of words that alliterate, so that you, you're cured and comforted. Um, remove the cause or reveal it. If altogether thou mayst not be cured, yet mayst thou be comforted. If there be anything that either by my friends may be procured, or by my life attained, that may either heal thee in part, or help thee in all. See how careful he's being with very small units of, symp of, of um, symmetry. If there be anything that either by my friends may be procured, or by my life attained, that may either heal thee in part, or help thee in all, I protest to thee by the name of a friend, that it shall but rather be gotten with the loss of my body than lost by getting a kingdom. That's fairly complicated, but not impenetrably so. It shall rather be gotten with the loss of my body than lost by getting gotten and lost, lost and getting body and kingdom. <coughs> Thou hast tried me, therefore trust me. Well, that's short enough to be a proverb. It's like, waste not, want not. Thou hast tried me, therefore trust me. Thou hast trusted me in many things, therefore try me in this one thing. <laughs> you see, the, the, um, it's almost simple-minded symmetry that now reverses the try and trust and makes it a little, a little bit longer. I never yet failed, and now I will not faint. Be bold to speak, and bless not. <laughs> thy sore is not so angry, but I can solve it. Thy wound not so deep, but I can search it. Thy grief not so great, but I can ease it. That's a, that's a three-decker. We've been having twos down to now. Now we, now we have a, tri a triplet. If it be right, it shall be lanced. If it be, bro if it be broken, it shall be tempted. Be it never so <coughs> desperate, it shall be cured. That's another three-decker. Somebody's counting. <laughs> you see, we, we moved from twos to threes now. Rise, therefore, you furies, and take heart at grass. Younger thou shalt never be. Pluck up thy stomach. <coughs> That's the uh, metaphorical stomach, which means courage, obviously. It's nothing to do with a pot belly. Pluck up thy stomach. If love itself have stung thee, it shall not stifle thee. Stomach stung stifle thee. We're getting threes now, but they're in alliteration, not in uh, syntax. Though thou be enamored of some lady, thou shalt not be enchanted. Back to a pair. They that begin the pine of a consumption, without delay preserve themselves with colossus. He that feeleth his stomach inflamed with heat, cooleth it up seems with conserves. Delays breed dangers, nothing so perilous as procrastination. I think the thought of reading a whole book like that gives most of us cold feet, but there is a whole book like that, it's Euphrase. In fact, it went on for two or three, two or three parts. So it's Euphrase, the anatomy of wit, and then Euphrase's letters, and then Euphrase's England. And um, somebody has pointed out the whole thing has the structure of the prodigal son, that is Euphrase, who's the the word means simply that he's um, well, well endowed. He has all the gifts, and he's at a <coughs> he's at a nice, safe place, namely Oxford University, which turns up in the book under a pseudonym. 
but he goes off to the big city. And what that means is that he starts listening to the, argu to the arguments of all kinds of specious people who lead him astray. And he has to be talked back into a proper frame of mind. That's the prodigal son story. The result is that you can have all the pops and vanities of this wicked world um, spread out before you. With all, the, with all the insidious things people say to lead the young astray into said pops and vanities, and the way the young can pull themselves together and get back to Oxford and live moral, moral and um, strenuous lives. <coughs> it's the anatomy of wit because in Lily's, in Lily's usage, wit is um, the kind of thing Satan whispers into your ear. It's, uh, it's that kind of wit. These very, these very smooth arguments that the bad guys always have. <coughs> and you're not surprised, therefore, to find that it's full of, uh, of people enjoining one another to um, pull their socks up and um, sometimes just get out of this dump and sometimes uh, repent. <coughs> or someone is about to change the station in life and is being given the appropriate advice. These are, um, these were regarded as very satisfying handbooks that covered every conceivable aspect of the, of the practical and moral life. Look at the Euphues section where, um, <coughs> where the father speaks with his daughter at leisure, and having knowledge of her former love, spake to her as followeth, Dear daughter, nice daughter begins with D in English, Dear daughter, as thou hast long time lived a maiden, so now thou must learn to be a mother. And as I have been careful to bring thee up a virgin, so am I now desirous to make thee a wife. Neither ought I in this matter to use any persuasions, for the maidens commonly nowadays are no sooner born but they begin to bride it. You know, girls have nothing but love on their minds nowadays. Neither to offer any great persons, for that thou knowest thou shalt inherit all my possessions, mine only care hath been hitherto to match thee with such an one as should be of good wealth able to maintain me, of great worship able to compare with thee in birth, of honest conditions to deserve thy love, and an Italian born to enjoy my lands. Uh, this is in code. Italian means English, of course. The, um, Oxford has, is given the name of an Italian city. I, I've forgotten what. It's right in the first sentence of the book, but I've forgotten it. And he, um, he goes to some jump for a flesh pot called Naples. <coughs> At the last I have found one answerable to my desire, a gentleman of great revenues, of noble progeny, of honest behavior, of comely personage, born and brought up in Naples. Uh -oh. For Lattus, thy friend, as I guess, thy husband is silly if thou like it. Neither canst thou dislike him who wanteth nothing that should cause thy liking, neither hath anything that should breed thy loathing. <coughs> 